JP, level negative four rider, YouTuber class D tier, strength level all day in computer chair, intelligence level vastly overestimates himself, dexterity level stumbles over our own feet, charisma level there are no matches left in your region, skills riding negative 74, avarice 9123, special abilities, you know what this stat sheet needs? Ability. Once a video, invoke the love triangle. Why can't he just do a normal intro? Ability. JP may start his video with an overly long opening bit, which is perfect for a video on literary RPGs. Literary role playing game, or lit RPG for short, is a work of fiction, most commonly fantasy or science fiction, that features video game mechanics as part of the story. Sometimes it's because the protagonist is trapped in a video game. Other times the world just operates on video game logic just because. Now I try not to get too neck deep in genre politics, but if science fiction and fantasy are both in the speculative fiction ghetto and sneered down upon by the rest of the literary types, then lit RPGs are a ghetto within a ghetto. Despite being a niche genre in a lot of ways, it is still one of the most requested topics I've gotten on this channel and has a sizable and loyal audience. I even asked for recommendations earlier this year. And for everyone who chimed in to give recommendations in the comments, I just want to say, I will get my revenge if it's the last thing I do. So let's check our stats, ready our overpowered skills, and tell the harem to pull up their thigh highs because we are diving headfirst into lit RPG. So what's the first thing our lit RPG needs? Is it compelling characters, an engaging plot, or well-realized setting? No, it's stats. So many stats, just endlessly obsessing over statistics. Levels, HP, skill levels, class levels, mana, XP, powers, special abilities, magic spells, elemental spells, summon spells, armor, weapons, other equipment, potions, crafting skills, magic items, and that's not even counting all of the pets and summons. Oh, you thought I would skip those for the sake of time and pacing? Well, you would be wrong. Here's the stats of the protagonist pet snail in case you were wondering. Now there's nothing wrong with stats or even stat pages. Stats are a great way to demonstrate a character's competence with statistical growth, adding a sense of progression and forward momentum. I wonder if I should use leveling and stat growth as a way to demonstrate character by showing which ability out of a list of abilities a character chooses from. Could I show a character's analytical ability by having them carefully inspect useless looking skills the RNG dumped on them and find ways to make them useful? What about using a foe with superior stats and have the protagonist outwit them rather than just beat them to death with numbers? Those won't work. Here's why. Stats exist in lit RPG solely to make the main character look powerful, not for use in characterization or setting the stakes. Stats work perfectly fine in a vacuum and don't need context to make any sense to the audience. Wow, this character has 9999 strength. Yay? Oh, that mouse has 10487 strength. Never mind. Huh. I wonder why in some video games, a high level character shows up in the beginning of the game to either help or hinder the protagonist and show off what high level characters can do. Are they using the tutorial as a preview of the eventual power that the main character might eventually gain or even surpass? No. That's just annoying, and I'll just have the protagonist start off shooting through the power ceiling in the first paragraph. I can accomplish this through a vast array of abilities I will give my main character. In fact, hardly any of the other side characters outside the protagonist's party get any worthwhile abilities, magic, or powers. It's just as well, since the protagonist isn't going to use those powers in any way other than as a beat stick. What really makes a magic power intriguing for the audience is when the protagonist blasts everything away with it, rather than use it in a clever or unexpected way. As I've said before, it's the abilities that make a character cool, not using the ability in a cool way. What about stat growth for a character? Well, for a main character, it should hit singularity by chapter one. Otherwise, a writer should meticulously obsess over plotting XP growth curves on graph paper. Writers definitely shouldn't consider making the stats grow at the speed of the plot. Better to draw quadratic equations and set hard rules, then throw those out on a whim later on with no explanation rather than keeping it vague. The stats, abilities, leveling, and game mechanics themselves are basically just a hard magic system. That is, it's a rules-based system that can be reasonably understood by the audience and usually doesn't have the same air of mystery as a soft magic system. The main thing to remember is that the more the writer defines the mechanics, the more beholden they are to sticking to those mechanics. 
But I'm special, so I can just discard my own rules midway through after tearing up my audience's willing suspension of disbelief and setting it on fire. Could this have been avoided by keeping certain aspects of the game mechanics vague, especially when said mechanics don't directly impact the story? No, I can't tell the difference between stats that are actually important to the events of the plot and stats that are just there as set dressing. Remove my precious extraneous game mechanics because they don't add anything in favor of focusing on ones that actually make the story engaging? Then I will have less stats, less stats, less lit RPG. I really need all those stats, levels, and abilities. Otherwise, I might have to write an actual freaking character rather than a collection of meaningless numbers largely devoid of context. Stats, abilities, levels, and all of that RPG stuff will substitute for things like character, motive, and having a personality. Besides, my protagonist does have a personality. Being endlessly horny is a personality, right? I mean, it is his only character trait other than being good at games. Man, and I thought urban fantasy writers had a hard time keeping both hands on the keyboard. Lit RPG requires its protagonist to be nothing but a horn dog every page. Just super horny, but in a 13-year-old kind of way. In urban fantasy, they at least break out the purple prose for the bedroom scenes. Lit RPGs have no such standards. Ah, to be 13, back in the days when the mere thought of mammaries was enough to entice my ardor, unlike now where I need 20 freaking tabs open. Alas, the mere word boobs no longer holds the same visceral appeal it once did. But that doesn't mean that a writer should actually try to write above an 8th grade level, even if half the book ends up being the word boobies pasted over and over again. By the way, did you know that there are other things that you can use as a primary motive for a character other than lust? There are, in fact, even other biological imperatives that exist. Even some of the more base individuals tend to be motivated more by societal acceptance, since they've managed to piece together that sex is somehow linked with status. There's also things like desire for wealth, thrill-seeking, curiosity, altruism, escapism, regret, finding identity, or any of the other basic emotions that can be one of the core drivers behind a character's decision making. Could they at least be a connoisseur of the desires of the flesh and have moved past the boob fixation? No, teenage immature lust it is. This never leads to other issues in the writing, like how the story keeps describing attractive women in detail, which is fine, I guess, even if there's too much of it and having the women characters prance about in battle lingerie annoys my inner tactician. Then the story keeps focusing on her reproductive bits and just generally has a little too much male gaze going on. Whatever, it's starting to get a bit weird, but no worse than half the trash anime I've seen, and at least there are not as many slave girls being rescued and kept as slave girls. Surely this won't turn into something problematic. And then the story lovingly describes their bodies being torn apart in a storm of gory violence. Whoa, that a red flag I see. Eh, I'll let this one slide. After all, a lot of the men also meet grizzly ends in the story. Then it happens again, and again, and again. Okay, this is starting to get kind of uncomfortable even for me. Eh, I'm sure it will be fine, even if I can get a clear picture of the writer's exact hentai search tags. Now, needless to say, depicting violence committed against women is something of a touchy subject. Should a writer tread carefully by making sure the violence matches the tone of the story without coming across as indulgent? Is the violence committed not entirely there for the protagonist's emotional motivation or for cheap shock value? Could it at least not be framed like a porn scene? Sorry, can't help myself. I must share my fetish material with the world. Is it at least well-written fetish material? Uh. So anyways, let's move on to something less controversial, like the harem. Wait. Oh, good God, not this freaking crap again. <clears throat> Sorry, where was I? Oh, yes, harems. Joy. Yes, this trope has even made its way into Western lit RPGs. The harem trope, for those lucky or sheltered enough to not know the term, is when a usually male character is surrounded by usually attractive young women characters who are all romantically interested in him. Wow, so this one guy gets his pick of a score of attractive admirers, right? Wrong. Instead, the main character wastes his time not committing to any of the obvious choices, often because of a series of increasingly stupid plot contrivances, or more often just by generally being a worthless waste of a human being with all the personality of a wad of chewing gum stuck under the desk, but with somehow less appeal. So here's the thing, 
Harems can work in lit RPGs by focusing on making the characters, especially the main character, have a little more personality than a cardboard box, or by thoughtfully deconstructing the trope with a focus on characterization. It is especially important to create interesting chemistry between all of the characters, and avoid too many weak links and contrivances to pad out the plot. Wait, I think that means that I might have to actually put in the legwork to make the protagonist's eventual romantic in-game choice, or lack thereof, interesting. Well, screw that. That gets in the way of my indulgent male fantasy. Now, how to make a harem work in a lit RPG story isn't as important a question than if the story even needs a harem in the first place. The answer is obviously yes, no matter how tired readers are of seeing it. God forbid we see some actual stories about battle couples, or even a story where, gasp, the male lead actually loses romantically and has to learn to move on. Or, you know, just let the audience enjoy a good round of murdering monsters without a contrived romantic plot thrown in for no good reason. No, we can't have that, so it's harems ahoy, like so many lit RPG stories before and most certainly more after. What if the audience doesn't want yet another lit RPG harem? Then just start the series with only a small romantic plot before sneaking in the harem later once the audience is invested. Besides, what am I going to do? Just not surround the main character with attractive women? You know what else I'm going to give the main character? I mean, a love triangle, obviously, thanks to the harem. But more than that, I plan to give him power of the overwhelming variety. Does the protagonist earn these abilities over time and with great effort? Do they gain this power by understanding the game system and finding clever ways to min-max their abilities and stats? Is there at least a trade-off for all of this overwhelming power? Nope, just blam. It's like the protagonist has access to the console. Either that or he paid to win. Having an overpowered protagonist is not a bad thing, just like having a special protagonist. After all, not everyone wants to read about the non-adventures of Average Man Generickson, the most boring barkeep in all the lands. One of the core appeals of role-playing games is the growth of the character's abilities as they dive deeper into mastery of the game's mechanics. Yet it is not the mastery that the audience seeks, it's the journey to mastery that we like to watch. Skipping the mastery is like taking a cab to the finish line of a marathon. It kind of defeats the point. But since when has scraping out a win at the very edge between victory and defeat ever made for a compelling story, one could easily design a game that is basically an I win button, or just turn to the last page of a book. But would that be fun? It would be for me. Who cares if it misses the point? What loser earns their power? Shortcuts to power never end badly. Besides, my main character is special because he probably found an exploit in the game system that's been there for years and that no one has found for some reason. Good thing no one ever patches the game and that it takes place in an alternate universe where people are too stupid to look for exploits. The main character also could just have their powers come out of nowhere too. Will this be something unique and interesting that also teases out a potential mystery? No, it's usually something stupid and obvious that most games would give everyone, but the writer has carved out just to make the main character special. Either that or the protagonist had a skill that was worthless, but then suddenly it's not. Now it's overpowered city. Population? One Kirito lookalike. Don't worry, I filed the serial numbers off. Do I suppose my protagonist doesn't always have to be an overpowered dude? There are also the monster protagonist lit RPGs that feature mimics or spiders or the like. Does this mean that they are not overpowered or surrounded by a harem of beautiful women? Of course not! How can the ladies resist the allure of a freaking box? Now these kinds of stories can be interesting in their own right. After all, featuring a non-human protagonist can be a good hook to stand out among a sea of dudes in black coats drowning in an ocean of cleavage. Or well, they used to stand out, at least until they spawned their own host of imitators. Especially with Isekai scraping out the bottom of the concept barrel nowadays. See, with the monster protagonist, it's totally different even though they are just as overpowered as every other human lit RPG protagonist. But see, now I can have my character act like a monster and people can't criticize me for it, because they are a monster and therefore are exempt from morality. Checkmate, critics. Now that I've given my main character approximately all of the power, what next? Well, now the protagonist needs a place to be overpowered in. In other words, I need a setting, and what better setting than Tolkien default? And no, it's not a lazy Tolkien copy-paste, because I added cat girls. Ooh, cat girls, pushing the originality there. This world operates on game logic, therefore it could be basically anything. It could be something fantastic and new that really dives deep into the endless possibilities a fantasy setting provides. It could explore truly unique and strange worlds full of never-before-seen creatures and peoples. But won't be, because I've already pressed Ctrl-V on the keyboard after hitting Select All on the Tolkien template. 
Besides, the real focus should be on how game mechanics affect the world itself. How does this world's inhabitants deal with game mechanics just being part of daily life? How would leveling impact the native ecology? Why hasn't anyone found the meta over the centuries? I mean, min maxers will break a game within hours of launch, yet RPG World has existed for untold eons without anyone finding an exploit until the protagonist came along. In real life, we don't really have levels, just people with skills that we don't really have many ways of effectively measuring. Even the greatest swordsman to ever exist could get ganged up on and taken down pretty quickly because real life combat is brutal. In RPG land, individuals can become nearly invincible if they survive long enough. How does the world deal with a bunch of high-level unkillable demigods waltzing around? Or has the world given up and just lets them run the place? Even just making people immune to infections changes everything. Thankfully, I don't need to put thought or creativity in considering how video game logic would change my world, even if that is half the appeal of lit RPG. In fact, why does the world run on video game logic? Adding context to this question could provide an opportunity to create a central mystery, or ground the story within a larger context. Or a writer could hand wave this if it wouldn't really achieve anything other than bogging down the story or just ignore it to save page space. But a better method is to highlight that the world runs on video game logic in a quippy annoying way and then just never explain why. This way you pique the audience's curiosity and then just leave them hanging while breaking their immersion, also known as the Marvel movie method. Besides, no one will care because everyone loves video game mechanics even if my world has mechanics that no game would ever have. This story takes place in a world where people can pay money to join a VR game that lets them feel actual pain. Yeah, sign me up for the open beta for that. Wow, an RPG where not only am I stuck with a class system, but the class is completely random with no options for customization. Oh, and all the skills and abilities are random as well. People should be lining up to play a game where success is decided for you before you even hit the installation button. That's where the in-game purchases come in. Now, I like random number generation as much as the next nerd, but is this too much RNG? Of course not. I heard you like RNG, so I'll put some RNG in your RNG. I mean, yes, roguelikes are a thing, a niche thing, and newer roguelikes tend to make adjustments for modern audience expectations. How do game mechanics feed into and reinforce each other? What is the core gameplay loop? Are the systems too simple or too complex? Who is the target audience for this game? Should I read a little bit of game theory while designing a fictional game? I don't see how that could help. Games are a series of interesting decisions, and my decision is to make the game part of the story bend to the whims of the writer, even if it comes at the cost of the audience's immersion and the story's consistency. Does the protagonist make any interesting decisions in the game, or did the writer make those decisions for them by handing them cheat codes? It's not like the writer has to become a full-fledged game developer or anything. Game developers have to ask themselves, what does this add to the game? Just as writers must ask, what does this add to the story? Would this actually be a fun game mechanic, or if not, why is it in the game? Well, I added that game mechanic because I thought it would be cool, and revision is a cool skill in the game, not a skill that a writer needs. Don't pay attention to my all over the place game design. Look at this exciting combat scene I wrote that goes blow by blow in such excessive detail that it becomes excruciatingly boring. Every action must be relayed to the audience regardless of the cost of pacing. How else will I show off my super clever game mechanics that all work perfectly in my head, I swear? Lit RPGs are a story first, but I'm going to instead treat it like my personal event log. You know, those things that you only read after a party wipe to find out what went wrong. Writers don't need to learn how to navigate between the game aspects and story aspects of lit RPG. That would require the writer to be able to distill the essence of the fun of games while also trying to navigate the treacherous currents of being a writer, two extremely difficult to master skill sets that must be blended seamlessly. In other words, it's total easy street. I've played lots of games, that makes me an expert on games, and I've read lots of… uh… Well, I've seen lots of books on shelves. How hard can it be to write a lit RPG? You won't see me worrying about shoddy game design. No one will notice the game's shoddy design anyway, because if you die in the game, you die in real life. Which, come to think of it, is also pretty shoddy game design. Probably should have nixed that bug in the beta. Now, why did I throw all my characters into a death game? Well, you know, it's funny. Much like how I was going to end this video, it's been so long I've forgotten the reason. There it is. Behold! The key to our inevitable and communist victory. The omni Commie Matrix. With it, we shall paint the TWA expanded universe red. You may now be jealous.
This is a very impressive structure, but what does it do? Observe. I don't think Stalin was that bad. Hollow do more? More like hollow accusation, am I right? All problems with North Korea are merely capitalist propaganda. This is your commu matrix thing? This is just a bunch of terminally online people posting poorly thought out opinions on the internet. What? No, it's not. We are one social media post away from victory. It shall be the fire that sparks the red revolution that will sweep across the universe. We don't even have to leave our echo chambers. Besides, you think your non-red revolution will be better? Well, obviously, we run in guns a-blazing, and then it's all pow, pow, pew, 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 and the bad guys are all like, oh, no. Then I say some kind of cool one-liner before shooting them with my cool guns. Then the evil empire just falls apart or something? I don't know. But after all the evil empires are vanquished, then there will be nothing but freedom. But we'll still get to be the cool rebels and keep fighting bad guys, and we'll never have to change our branding or get bogged down in something really boring like policy. I'm not sure what this policy thing is, but I do agree that that sounds boring. As boring as your dumb revolution. Our revolution will be way cooler because our ideology allows us to see the world for how it really is. A capitalist nightmare that can only be saved by communism. Nuh-uh. Our revolution is cooler because we see the world for how it really is. A totalitarian nightmare that can only be saved by shooting bad guys. The world as it really is? The universe is a yawning void, devoid of meaning and swirling within a vast cosmos that regards us with utter indifference and apathy. When one gazes into the abyss, they find merely an endless well of meaninglessness and is so full of dark secrets that what little greater knowledge mortal humans are able to comprehend will drive those to madness. That all of our ideological bickering is merely a distraction from our trivial existence in the face of a world full of uncaring dark gods who regard us as no more than motes of insignificant dust. You must be great at parties. Comrade Prime, we have intercepted a transmission from the vile capitalist. Put it through. Greed, we finished our preliminary survey. Go ahead. Survey results are promising. The TWA universe has become quite expansive, especially with its new animations. But we will be in good company on Nebula. Nebula is full of amazing storytelling and animation creators. They've amassed quite a pool of talent. Nebula is a streaming platform run by the creators themselves. There we can put up all of our videos without having to worry about suitability for ads or YouTube murdering the video for no reason. There you can watch terrible writing advice videos early and ad free. You can also enjoy Nebula ever-growing collection of original content, like Tail Foundry's excellent original series, World Smiths, that explore the inner nature of the real-world creators of fantastic settings. What about the old deal, though? In regards to the bundle deal, many signed up to Nebula through a bundle deal, as an email may have notified you. That deal is complete. To keep access to Nebula with a new discount, you can go to nebula.tv slash terriblewritingadvice or click the link in the description below. Signing up with this link gets a 40% discount, basically $250 a month billed annually, or $5 a month that gets you full access. Part of that subscription directly helps the channel in its quest to put the expanded into the TWA expanded universe on top of getting access to ad-free terrible writing advice. Be sure to use my link to get the discount. One more thing of interest. Until the end of 2023, Nebula is offering lifetime memberships for $300. Just pay once and it's yours. A novel concept in today's rent-seeking economy. And they can be gifted. A nice little last-minute present. Link is in the description, of course. Now, only a few details to wrap up. So this nebula is Greed's goal? Well, it doesn't matter. We are already poised to defeat our true enemies once and for all. Prepare to activate the Omni-Kami Matrix.